Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. I want to talk about Christian election. I'm not talking about politics. It was God calling you. We actually have a booklet on the subject called Is God Calling You? And I'm going to be going through parts of this today. This particular booklet and any other one that I may hold up is available free online at www.ccog.org. ccog.org. Go to the Literature tab, click Books and Booklets. This book and many other ones will come up. You can read them at your leisure or leisure. Now, could God actually be calling you or has He actually called you? No, actually, right now, God is calling people out of this sin-sick world. This world is dying. And He has a calling for a fantastic purpose for those who are being called in this age. It's awe-inspiring, but people have trouble believing it. You know, hopefully you're being called right now. You need to know, unless you ignore it, because you don't want to ignore a call from the great God, the creator of the entire universe. Now, there's various common ideas out in the professing Christian world uh, that the Greco-Roman Catholics and the Protestants have. And that is basically that there's a battle taking place right now. The battles between good and evil, between God and Satan. Basically, the idea teaches that God is trying to save everyone now, and Satan's trying to get everybody lost. And if that's true, if you're honest about it, it would seem that God is losing. But since God is love, God is all-knowing, God is all-wise, and God came up with a plan, does he come up with a plan where Satan wins? I, I don't believe it. And, you know, you know, even if you count all the nominal Christians, people call themselves Christian, and even if all of them were supposed to be saved despite the fact they don't live like Christians and all this kind of stuff, most of them, well, hardly any of them do, then basically most of humanity is lost and has throughout history has been lost. And nowadays, um, you know, the majority of people in the world certainly don't profess Christianity, but even in places like the United States and uh, Great Britain, which were bastions, if you will, of professing Christianity, and in many countries it's officially the religion, but in places like uh, the United States, I think less than half the people now go to church. People uh, claim to have a spirituality, but less and less of them actually believe uh, much about the Bible. And some have said, well, this means everybody's going to be saved. It doesn't matter what religion they are. They don't have to believe in Jesus or anything because all religions are the same. We're seeing more and more of that. But as far as salvation goes, let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4. I'll start in verse 10, and I'll be reading from uh, the New King James most of the time. If not, I'll explain, I'll mention whichever one I plan on doing. But anyway, if we go to Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 10, we read, Let it be known to you all the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Verse 11, this is a stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So we see Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, like Buddha, etc. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now billions of people have lived and died without even hearing the name of Jesus, the Christ, let alone understood the truths of the Bible. Well, what about those people? What about little babies who only live for a few hours? Has God caused them all to be doomed? Are they lost forever? No, absolutely not. Everyone will have a chance or an opportunity for salvation. We have a booklet on that, by the way, called the Universal Offer of Salvation. A lot of people claim to believe the Bible. Many people have read the Bible but they've not put together certain scriptures or they've looked over, overlooked certain things or been mistaught or based upon false traditions. They do not understand that God does have a plan for everyone, uh, some for this age and others in the age to come. And this particular book that I'm holding up is also available at ccg.org and it's got hundreds of scriptures in it. But today, that focus is 
on are you being called now? And the reality is, or it's a shocking fact to many, God's not trying to call everyone at this time. It's a lack of understanding of God's plan to cause Protestant evangelists to shout in this age, give your heart to the Lord before it's too late. But the inspired word of God reveals that no one can come to Jesus Christ unless the Father specifically calls him. Who said that? Well, in John 6, verse 44, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, said that. So let me quote that. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Similarly, in John 6, 65, Jesus taught, Therefore I said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. So this is not some misstatement Jesus accidentally said once. It's, he's emphasizing it a second time here. God the Father must call any who are going to come to Jesus. But God hasn't called everyone now. In other words, God's got to call someone in order to be saved in this age. Now Jesus explained this to his intimate followers that they've been called. You don't have to go there. In John 15, verse 19, Jesus said, I chose you out of the world. Now the Bible is filled with proof positive that all Christians must receive the divine call from God. And it's a very positive story. The plain truth is God's not trying to save the whole world now, but has a plan for all. God is not losing. Satan is not winning. Oh, I know, it looks like he's winning various places. That's not the, the truth. Another truth to grasp is if God's calling you, well, that includes your salvation. It's more than just about you. And for those who are called, they're called to a calling. I mean, what is that? Well, first, it's a calling to a changed life, a life of overcoming sin and self, growing in grace and knowledge, says in 2 Peter 3.18, Building character while enduring to the end for salvation, as you can see in Matthew 10, 22. God sent his son Jesus, John 3, 16 and 17, so you can have a new life in Christ, which we can read about also in Romans 6, 24, excuse me, 6, 4, chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 23. Now, if we go to 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17, I'll read something here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new uh, creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It'll be a new creation. Now you've sinned. And we're going to go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. Yet no matter what you did, you can be forgiven and given a stretch, a fresh start in the in your life the truth of God if you will accept God. So let me read uh, what the John wrote. 1 John 1, verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in a light as he's in a light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. You say, but no, you don't understand my sins. They're really, no. it doesn't have a little asterisk. Blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. You repent. Now, some people are on the opposite end. And John warns about them too, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So what are we supposed to do? Verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we'll confess them. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word, his word is not in us. Now I want to go to Matthew 13, starting verse 44. Again, this is this is words of Jesus. John, again, the kingdom of God, heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, 
And for joy over it, he goes and he sells all he has and he buys that field. Again, the king of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he found one pearl of great price, went out and sold all he had and bought it. Now, I don't think any pearl is worth that. But the Christian calling is a pearl of greater pri great price. It's more than that. It's more than some physical thing some collector or hobbyist is interested in. I want to go to Ephesians 2. The Christian calling provides hope to those who otherwise would not have had it. Breaking into uh, verse 12 of Ephesians 2. At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And with this calling, you're supposed to support the work of God. Things such as what Jesus said in preaching the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14. Preaching the gospel of all the words Jesus said, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Now the great purpose of being called now is to be trained to rule with Christ and to teach under him when he comes in his kingdom. When all Israel will be saved. We're being trained, prepared, fitted, through tests and trial, through hardship, through persecution, through tribulation, with continual Bible study and prayer, growing the grace and knowledge to be able then to fill a high office of king and priest. And you can read about that, Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 5, 10, and uh, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Either to rule in a civil sense or to preach God's truth when the time comes, so that all might be privileged to understand and to be called. Furthermore, one of the things we're supposed to do is to make eternity better for ourselves and everyone else. We have a book that goes into that in more depth called The Mystery of God's Plan. Why did God create anything? Why did God make you? Also available at the ccog.org website. Almost nobody on planet Earth understands why God created anything or why God made them. This booklet goes into that. You know, we've got a glorious mission if we lead a true Christian life. The elect have an opportunity now to be working towards this. Now, you don't have to go there, but when asked why he spoke in parables, in Matthew 13, verse 11, Jesus said, to his disciples, to be given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And I hold up our mystery booklet. But to them has not been given. Now see, this goes against a common misconception. Or why we would call this fake news. That, that suppose Jesus spoke in parables so the common person would understand him. Uh, no, Jesus spoke in parables so they wouldn't get it. Furthermore, I'm going to read from uh, Paul's writings, Romans 11, verse 7. I might want to go there. Can I read a couple other verses from uh, Romans 11? Paul wrote, verse 7, Romans 11, What then? Has Israel, Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So the elect, so I talk about Christian election, are the ones who are called. They can obtain something that various uh, physical descendants of Israel were not able to do. Only the elect can obtain salvation in this age. The rest have been blinded. Now, in John 15, 22, Jesus said, those who are blinded have an excuse. Now, in, in Romans 11, Paul shows that salvation has only come to a few, the elect in Israel, and to some of the Gentiles. And why? Go to verses 31 to 32. He gives an explanation. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown to you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. God's allowed them to be disobedient. God has allowed Satan to test, 
tempt them and to uh, influence them. Most people are blinded now that through mercy shown to those who are called now, they can obtain mercy and salvation. And I held up this book before, but I'll hold it up again. People do not understand this. Hardly anybody on planet Earth understands this. And we've got hundreds of scriptures here for those who are interested in knowing the truth. God's plan is uh, wonderful. Now, it should be pointed out that there are more Gentiles that are going to be called. If you're still in Romans 11, just back up to verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. So don't think, oh, I'm so much better than the Jews, that's why God called me. No, that's not what Scripture says. Now I want to read something that the late Pastor General, the old Worldwide Church of God, wrote about Romans 11, verse 25. This is in uh, Tomorrow's World Magazine, September 1971. And it's also in this booklet. Herb Armstrong wrote, Now study carefully, beginning in verse 25. Blindness in part is happened to Israel. How long? Forever? No, note it. Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The end of this age during which God is calling a people from among the Gentiles to bear his name, Acts 15, 14. And so says Romans eleven twenty six. All Israel shall be saved. How? As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. The deliverer, Jesus Christ, is coming again. Notice verse 31. These blinded Israelites have not now, in this age, received mercy. That through the mercy of the Gentiles saved in this age, they may then obtain mercy and salvation. How? Because these saved Gentiles will then be kings and priests assisting in this wonderful work. Now clearly, clearly, we're much closer to the time the Gentiles are to come in, uh, later to be kings and priests, than when Herbert Armstrong wrote this back in 1971. He wrote it 50 years ago. And more Gentiles had to be called, and that is happening in the continuing church of God. Now Jesus made it clear that the end does not come until the gospel of the kingdom of God be preached to the world as a witness. And where did I put that booklet? It ended up being further down here. And we have a booklet on this. We have this booklet, by the way, in over 100 languages. If you do go to ccg.org, instead of going to the literature tab, if you just keep going down further on that page, you will see a listing of over 100 languages that this book has been translated in that you can click on or send to your, tell your friends about. Anyway, the end doesn't come until the gospel of the kingdom of God reaches enough nations, according to Jesus, Matthew 24, 14, and the full number, as the uh, NIV, NLT, BSB, CEV, GNT, ISV, and that by a bunch of other translations, put Romans eleven twenty five. 25. And to, the end doesn't come until the full number of Gentiles God wants in this age come on in. Now, I want to go to Revelation 2, verse 26 and 27. Now, for those who do what Jesus wants, including Gentiles, the Bible teaches, Revelation 2, verse 26, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. Now, I want to go to Romans 8, verse 14. Now this time I'm going to be reading from the uh, AFB because it gets the grammar of the Holy Spirit right. It's the pronoun, the grammar right with the pronoun of the Holy Spirit, etc. Romans 8, starting verse uh, 14 from the AFB. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now you have not received a spirit of bondage, again unto fear, but you received a spirit of sonship, whereby we call out Abba Father. The Spirit itself bears witness conjointly with our own spirit, testifying that we are the children of God. Now, if we are the children, we are also heirs, truly heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer together with Him, so that we may also be glorified together with Him. Now, Christians, 
called in this age, are to be joint heirs with Jesus in the kingdom of God. Were you predestined to be called? Perhaps. Probably. Does this mean that your ultimate fate has been decided for you in advance? No. Very few people understand what predestination is. First, let me talk about what it's not. There's no teaching in the Bible that says the decision that you're going to make, your final fate to becoming saved or lost, is already predetermined, and that you are uh, predetermined to arrive at that fate. Predestination is not about the fate to be being predestined to be lost. But does the Bible say anything about predestination? Certainly. But it doesn't say what most people seem to think. People seem to think some are predestined to be saved and some are predestined to be lost, but the Bible doesn't say that. So let's go to Ephesians 1, starting in verse 4, and read what the Bible actually says. Apostle Paul taught, Ephesians 1, cutting in verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. While some are predestined to be called in this age, most humanity has not been predestined to permanently be lost. Also in Ephesians 1, go down to verse 11. In him, that's Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who were first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. God's will is that all will be saved. God's got a plan. It results in nearly everybody who ever lived to be saved. Christians were predestined to be called, but we have to choose whether or not to be faithful. You do have a choice. You have a choice to be part of the elect or a choice not to be. So you can elect to be the elect if you're being called. Now I want to go to Romans 8. You know, we've, the Bible tells us we're predestined to be the praise of God's glory. But Romans 8, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, supposed to be like Jesus, so that we might that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. After we resurrected, we be brethren in that sense. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. None of the places... In the Bible, where predestination is mentioned, says anything about being predestined to be lost. Even though various ones believe this, people are not predestined to reject Christ. No one's predestined to make a certain decision to accept or reject Christ, to be saved or lost. But some have been predestined to be called to salvation now in this age. If you've been predestined, your selection and election was by God. We can go to, uh, I'm going to read Jude 1.1 1, 1 from the BBE, which is Bible Basic English. Jude 1.1. 1, 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those of God's selection who have been made holy by God the Father and are kept safe for Jesus Christ. I'm going to go to this read. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 14, it's just uh, 1, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1 and verse 4. Grace to you, the Apostle Paul writes, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 4. Knowing, brethren, your election by God. Christian election is by God. Now, let's go to 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and be multiplied. 
We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I want to go to Ephesians 2. Yes, I read lots of scriptures. Starting verse 8. God's beloved are called to be holy, obedient, and kept safe for Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now don't misunderstand. God's grace is free and unmerited, but if we refuse to change our lives, to obey God, He's under no obligation to bestow His grace upon us. God's Spirit gives us the power we need to develop character, but we've got to work at it. I want to go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, read something from the Apostle Paul. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly then they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. You know, God will not allow Christ's sacrifice to be taken lightly. And at least partially because of this, Luke 12.32 shows that only a small number of the faithful uh, will be there at, at the beginning. Jesus said, Luke 12.32, Do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Only if you find Christ now, as uh, Matthew seven thirteen to fourteen points out, and Jesus teaches. Matthew seven, verse thirteen. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. So most are not going to go the right way. Why? Part of the reason Jesus said, verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and a few who find it. Now this is the same Jesus who said he came to save more than the few in uh, Luke 13, 29 to 30. I want to go to uh, Romans 11 again. Paul shows that while God has not cast away his people forever, he's only called a remnant now. And this election is because of grace. Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. Let's go down to verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. We keep hearing about calling an election. I'm going to go to the Old Testament. You don't have to go there. I'm going to go to uh, Zechariah 10. Read verse 6. I will strengthen the house of Judah... And I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside. Now how can people be as though they were not cast aside if they're not going to get an opportunity for salvation in the age to come? Which is again why I've held up this book a few times. It goes into that in more depth. But not all have an opportunity in this church age. There's, but there's no partiality with God. It says Romans 2.11, there's, there's no partiality with God. Ephesians 6.9, there's no partiality with Him. And in Acts 10.34, in truth I perceive you, God shows no partiality. Since God does not have partiality, there must be a plan for the rest. A plan for those not called and chosen in this age. Because God is not partial nor does he love them any less than those he's calling now. They are not being called and chosen this age in order to reduce the chance that they'll blaspheme the Holy Spirit and commit the unpardonable sin. Yet they will have an opportunity in the age to come, and this book goes into that. Now, as the first fruits are those who are being called now. They're part of an earlier reign, but a latter reign is going to come, per Hosea 6, verse 3, which I'll read. Hosea 6, verse 3. Let us know, let us pursue knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established in the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain. And by the way, the old Worldwide Church of God and the old Church of God Seventh Day taught this as well, by the way. 
Now I'm going to go to James 5, 7. This rain that's going to come in the future represents a harvest according to James 5, verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently until it receives the early and the latter rain. The early rain refers to those being called now. Those not being called now will be called later. As I said, I've held up this book a few times. This is more on those who will be called later. Now I want to go to 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 1. Starting in verse 8. Of those called now in this age, notice God, cutting in verse 8, verse 9 now, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Yes, God had planned before time as we know it began. God has a plan for you if you're being called before time began. If you're being called, it was before time began. It was a long time ago. We don't really know how old the universe is. There's all kinds of speculation. Some say six or 7,000 years, and I think that's an understatement. Others say it's 14.6 uh, billion years, plus or minus. And that's only for the part of the universe they think they can see, and they don't know beyond that. So, it's been a long time. God's calling you. He planned to call you. But at this point, a plan has been in place for perhaps billions or tens of billions of years. Now, as Ephesians 1 said, you know, God said He chose us before the foundation of the world, having predestined us. But to be lost? No. Ephesians 1.11. To the adoption of as sons by Jesus Christ himself being predestined according to his purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Again, were any people predestined to be lost? Uh, no. Uh, there's other issues about stuff. I don't, uh, we're not going to get into the beast, false prophet, and uh, Judas on this. God knew some were not going to accept his plan. That they had opportunities and choices that they had to make. God wants all to be saved, says in 1 Timothy uh, 2, verses 3 through 4. So predestination has nothing to do with whether or not we'll be lost or saved, or does it? Predestination has to do with whether you're to be called in this age. Those predestined are those who trust first in Christ. And we're the first fruits of a preliminary harvest. And that's part of the glorious truth. Predestination has to do with the timing of our calling, whether we're being called now in this age or we're going to be called later. Now, I want to read Romans 8, uh, 28 to 30, part of this from uh, the Old King James Version of the Bible. For whom he did foreknew, how great is God, you're one who's called now, he foreknew you. And for new, and whom he foreknew, did he also predestine to be lost? No. It says in verses 29-30, we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom he pre did predestinate, he also called. So I've read this from the Old King James and the New King James now. Not all are going to be, will be called in the future. Some are called now in this age. And Romans 8.30, Moreover, whomever he predestined, these also he called. Predestination has to do with being called, not being predestined to be saved or lost. Those being called now, in this age, were foreknown and predestined to be called now, to be the first to put their hope in Christ, to be glorified with him when Christians are changed at the resurrection. You can read that, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 51 to 53. And others uh, will be called later. God doesn't decide for you in advance whether you're going to be saved or lost. He did decide far in advance which ones he was going to call. 
he was the first calling for an opportunity to be a kings and priests of his kingdom, to have a part in the saving of others. You know, how wonderful are God's ways when he opens our understanding to reveal his ways to us. So we need to make our calling and election sure. Now the very fact of wartime casualties, deaths of children, accidental deaths, has caused a lot of uh, uh, sorrow and grief, some of which is entirely unnecessary. And the Bible says the grieving is okay, but some are grieving that their loved ones who have died or killed or whatever are going to fry for eternity or something along those lines. They think that they've been eternally lost. When if they understood the truth, they'd realize they probably weren't lost at all. And this is belief has given rise to a, a general assumption, which is a, a great error. Is that basically that the assumption is that there's only two classes, uh, uh, like the living or the dead, the saved and the lost. You now some have said there's no middle ground. Either you're in this minute saved or you're a lost soul. And this teaching has caused uh, untold suffering and, and, and grief. By the way, we are in the Continuing Church of God are not Protestant, and we have a booklet. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I'm going to, let me get up. I usually don't do it this way, but I'm going to go up and grab this particular one. I want to hold this up. Uh, Hope of Salvation, how the Continuing Church of God differs from Protestantism. Uh, we do not agree with Protestantism. Protestantism has most people who ever lived to fry for eternity or be burned up if they're, when they're nihilists. But that's the vast majority, according to Protestantism, will not be saved. They did, the Protestants do not believe that the God of love had enough love and wisdom and knowledge to come up with a plan of salvation that would work for nearly all who ever lived. They have kind of the reverse. The vast majority who ever lived will not be saved. We don't agree. It's one of the reasons why this title is Hope of Salvation. Because in the continuing church of God, we know the Bible teaches about salvation and the hope. And the hope is some will be call, are called in this age, others will be called in the age to come. Protestantism does not like that particular teaching, amongst other teachings. Now, some think that uh, the Protestant view is right because they say this is the only day of salvation, but that's not true. Uh, according to the Bible, it's not true. But people say, but doesn't the Bible say that? There's two verses that people tend to point to. I'm going to read the first one from um, Isaiah 49, verse 8, and I'm reading it from the interlineal transliterate, transliterated Bible because I want it to read it literally what it says, because sometimes translators throw in words and things that aren't supposed to be there. Yeah, ITB says, Thus says the Lord, In time and acceptable have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. Okay. A day of salvation. But doesn't it say in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, that uh, 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 now is the day of salvation? Actually, no, it doesn't. Oh, yes, yeah, so you've got things like the King James Version of the Bible that teach that. Uh, but that's a mistranslation. And I know some people think that the King James Version is always right and was totally inspired by God and such things that are not true. On that, we have another book, free at ccog.org, Who Gave the World the Bible? We go into, amongst other things, which books should be in the Bible, does the true church know what they were throughout history, etc., etc., but also some sections about errors in the King James Version so people will realize that, no, this was not inspired by God. But anyway, I do want to read, related to uh, 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 Corinthians here, 6-2, uh, uh, Corinthians 6-2. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading this from the literal standard version. And this is based on modern scholarship. It hasn't been out uh, too, too, too many years. I'll go back and read it again. For he says, in an acceptable time I heard you, and in a day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is a well-accepted time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. And now is a day of salvation for those being called and for uh, those who truly are being called and understand. Now is the day of salvation for them. But it's not the only day of salvation. 
the Greek language uses versions of the word the, the definite article the, the, a lot. But it does not have it in that verse. They tend, the Greeks tended to overuse a definite article, but it's not in that verse, despite what translations you might read that have it in there. That's not in the Greek. I've looked at the literal Greek. Yes, I have studied Koine Greek. Uh, and it's not in there. Bible teaches now is a day of salvation. But many uh, don't understand that. Anyway, ultimately, God will offer salvation to every person on who's ever lived, either in this age or in the age to come. And part of his plan includes the first resurrection for those who are uh, called, chosen, and faithful in this age. Now those who are not called now have an opportunity for salvation. Now there's billions who've lived and died from the time of Adam to close this age who are going to come up in the second resurrection. You can read about that resurrection in uh, Revelation 20. They're going to come up as physical human beings. They're going to be judged. They'll give their, be given their one and only true opportunity for salvation. Now this resurrection takes place a thousand years after the first one. Uh, and so this kind of comes after what we tend to call the millennium. Uh, and in the millennium, uh, we believe God will call all everyone who's then living. Now I want to go to Isaiah 29. Start in verse 14. I will again do a marvelous work among his people. Verse 24, Isaiah 29. These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding, and those who complained will learn doctrine. Most professing Christians, here's one example, are, ignor are in ignorance of this basic truth, basically because of non-biblical traditions often being taught as Christian doctrine. Now the Bible in Revelation 12, 9 teaches that Satan deceives the whole world and he's a liar and a father of lies in uh, John 8, 44. So I'm going to go to Jeremiah 16. You might be pleased to realize that God says he still has a plan for those who are misled by Satan and uh, Satan-influenced human tradition in this age. Jeremiah 16, let's go to verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthless and unprofitable things. Yes, they're talking about traditions from the fathers, whether these are so-called church fathers or whatever. These are traditions. Verse 20. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will... this. Once, cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know my name is the Lord. All were not expected to know the truth of this age. But as both Isaiah and Jeremiah wrote, many are going to have this opportunity. So we don't need to grieve when we have departed loved ones who probably weren't being called in this age because God's going to raise them again. The chances are they simply weren't called Uh, they shall be resurrected and they have their uh, spiritual blindness removed in the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20 and uh, consistent with Isaiah 65 verse 20. Now if you are one being called and you're faithful and finally chosen, you may be used then to minister them and to help lead them to salvation and eternal life. I mentioned I, uh, Revelation 20 uh, verses four to six, and I'll get there in a moment. But right now, those who are called, the Bible says judgment is on those now called in First Peter 4.17, which is one of the reasons why we tend to have various tests and trials more so than the world around us. We're supposed to endure those, build character, so we can grow in grace and knowledge and be able to serve others, love others, increase the amount of love in the universe, in our own unique way. But we are later going to judge uh, judge the world. I mentioned uh, Revelation 20, verse 4 and 6. I'm going to skip over uh, most of that. Just go to verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he who is part of the first resurrection. That's those who are being called now and accepted. Over such the second death has no power. They shall be 
priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. That is a glorious hope. Those called now are blessed and holy if they remain faithful. And that's really good news. And there's no injustice with God. He wants all saved. I mentioned or referred to 1 Timothy, so let me read 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God denies no one an opportunity for salvation, but he's only calling those who, in this age, who he knows may properly respond and endure. And others later. The vast majority of humanity has not been called yet. In Satan's age, it will be a later time. God's not trying to save or convert everybody now. Now, didn't some say, well, didn't Jesus say the purpose of the gospel was to convert all nations? No. Matthew 24, 14 has the words of Jesus. And he said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the world. I was looking for the book. I told it up while I read it. The problem is I keep going through lots of different booklets. And I, it's not a problem, but then I move him in different spots. Now I don't see where I put that particular one. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. Jesus said, In this gospel of the kingdom we preach in all the world's a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. After the end comes, the seventh uh, trumpet sounds, and a new age when the reign of uh, Jesus will replace the reign of Satan. And while during his present age, many in number are called, it's still that number is just a small minority. Others will be called later. And as I mentioned, we have this booklet on, or the book on the universal offer of salvation goes into about those being called later. Now, how can you know if God's calling you? Many under, misunderstand God's calling. They think, oh, unless he's spoken to me with a, lot of a voice, maybe that doesn't count. Some think you have to have a drastic intervention, such as an accident or fire. And some think they just need a good feeling all over to be sure they're calling. Well, all those things could, some or all those things could happen, although God doesn't tend to uh, use the audible voice. How does God though, really tend to call? Um, basically, he calls through the power of his Holy Spirit. Now the gospel is the good news of God's coming government, his kingdom of God, our conversion. It's recorded in the Bible. It's God, the Bible is God's word to humankind. Through the power of God's Holy Spirit, he opens the minds of those who, who are being called so we can understand the plain truths of God's message in this gospel. God's Spirit begins to work with those who he's calling. As Jesus said in John 14, 15 through 17, God's Spirit leads you to truth if you will trust God as you should. Also read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 about trusting the Lord. Now I want to go to 1 Corinthians 3. Once you're granted the Holy Spirit after baptism, you're the temple of God. Verse 16, starting verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone uh, defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple is holy, which you are. God calls those who he could use in this age and those he knows who can make it. And salvation is to those who will obey him, as it says in Hebrews 5, verse 9. And God gives his Holy Spirit, it says in Acts 5, 32, to those who obey him. So some Protestant types who say you don't have to obey God uh, and you'll still be saved, apparently do not understand scriptures such as Hebrews 5, Hebrews 5, 9, uh, Acts 5, 32, and many others. And this is one of the reasons why we put out this book, Hope of Salvation. Now, I want to go to Second Peter, and I'm going to read a fair amount from there, because I'd like to read some stuff that Peter wrote. Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Peter writes, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord, Jesus our Lord. 
As His divine power is given to us, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who, call us, who called us by glory and virtue, which would be given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature, as we could be deified, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. But for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and yes, we are to be kind, and to brotherly kindness love, so we can be showing love. For... If these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, is forgotten he was cleansed from all his sins, from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Be diligent to obey. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I noticed that uh, one thing that I mentioned in that particular booklet was another booklet, which I have here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to hold two of them up. One is called Christians, Ambassadors to the Kingdom of God. Help you live as a Christian. And since I brought up faith, we also have a booklet on faith that you might find helpful. And I'll hold this one up as well. We also have a booklet on prayer. Again, all these are available at the ccog.org website. What will God's Holy Spirit do? How does it work through the human mind? Initially, the Spirit of God will lead one who's being called to believe He exists. In this age of skepticism and doubt, it's chic to deny the existence of God. But God's Spirit working with you would be impossible for you to deny God's existence. It's a sign that God's calling you. Now, I will stand up another time here. I want to hold up another one. You can believe, you can prove God exists. We have a book, Is God's Existence Logical? If God's calling you, this will make a lot of sense. You can also prove Jesus is the Messiah. If God's calling you, you'll be able to prove this. It's not just blind faith. You can prove there is a God. You can prove God exists. If God's calling you, you should do that. The Apostle Paul wrote, Prove all things, in the old King James, hold fast which is good. These booklets, and book, book and booklet, should help you do that. Yes, we have lots of reading materials you can do to study on your own, to prove it. Compare what we teach with, against what the Bible says. I'm going to go to uh, 2 Peter 3. I mean, it's actually 2 Timothy 3. God's Spirit will have you prove believe the Bible's word of God, which this book also this book also helps you do. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. How can people really believe the Bible if they feel that some parts are not inspired? But yet, that's what many who are called Christians believe particularly about the Old Testament and certain historical things. Some falsely claim that the Ten Commandments are done away. Uh, we have a book on that. We go into the different arguments on that. Uh, but in the book of Revelation, Revelation uh, 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12, say that Christians are, or the saints are those who have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. Some will try to say, well, that only just means Jews called during the tribulation or some nonsense like that. No, it means Christians are supposed to be keeping the commandments of God. Sadly, some follow, follow the example of Gnostic leaders and other false leaders about such things. We either believe all the Bible or none of it. It's as simple as that. Jesus said, John 10.35, Scripture cannot be broken. The scriptures make a complete chain. They don't contradict one another. Yeah, yeah, there's books about supposed biblical contradictions. But Jesus said the Bible does not contradict itself. Every one of these supposed contradictions is a result of either a mistranslation, a scribal error, or a misinterpretation. Unless you approach scripture with this truth, you're not going to be able to grasp the full meaning of God's word. 
you can fool yourself into believing that God's word is full of contradictions and can't be relied upon. And you can see all kinds of nonsense documentaries and stuff who get all kinds of things wrong. I saw one recently that said that, uh, yeah, Jericho burned, but it was uh, couldn't have burned after uh, around 1200 A.D., B.C., 1200 B.C. It happened way before then. Therefore, the exodus didn't happen. Therefore, uh, you can't really rely on the word of God. problem is, they've got it off by a couple hundred years. Because the exodus was roughly 1446, and therefore... Uh, Jericho burned probably around uh, uh, 1406 plus or minus uh, B.C. And that is consistent with the burning that they have there. Anyway, you can truly believe the Word of God. Another uh, way God's Spirit uh, guides us is those who He's calling us to inspire us to take God at His Word. He says His Word, He says what He means, He means what He says. Those who God's call through His Holy Spirit believe simple statements that are recorded in the Bible. If God's calling you, a spirit will lead you to believe Christ did not come to do away with God's laws. And you can read about that, for example, in Matthew 5, 17. You'll believe the kingdom of heaven is not in heaven, but uh, uh, will be here on earth. As it says, for example, in uh, Matthew 5, starting verse 3, Bless the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So, that's what we're supposed to have happening here. We'll also know, by the way, the Bible says in Ezekiel 18.4 and 18.20, now, you don't have to go there, but it says, all souls are gods, and souls that sin shall die. It says that in both places. Uh, many people don't believe the soul dies. They believe it uh, lives uh, forever, either in uh, heaven or uh, being burnt without burning up uh, uh, below or something. In 2 Peter 1, verse 20, you don't have to go there. It says, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. Many can't uh, accept or understand scripture or prophecy because they haven't understood the idea that the Bible interprets itself. And I'm not going to go through a bunch of examples in there, but uh, some of the examples are in this free book, It's God Calling You. So I'm to skip over those type of things right now. I want to go to Matthew 4, verse 4. God's Spirit will lead those who, who He's calling to strive to live by every word of God. Matthew 4, verse 4. But He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. To really understand the Bible, it's paramount to live by every word of God. Not just some parts or pet doctrines. Most professing Christians accept some Bible truths, but for the most part, they misunderstand. How can they live by the Word of God if they don't realize what it means? Candidly speaking, all professing Christians are not willing to live by every Word of God. Some deliberately reject all uh, but a small portion of the Bible. It has no real bearing on their personal lives. God gives us understanding only those who are willing to live by His Word, or as it says in the New Testament, those who will obey Him. Another way God uses His Spirit is calling His people is by convicting them, convincing them of His way. If God's calling you, you'll be able to uh, understand the Bible more fully for the first time. Now the Bible warns, you don't have to go there, but uh, Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is a way of death. Humanity's way is a grasping, greedy way of getting. It's kind of a do to others for they do it to you kind of a thing. It's a way of strife, envy, murder, jealousy, wrath, drunkenness, and all the rest. If God's calling you, His Spirit will convince you to admit you've been going the way of humanity and not God's way. You'll say, let God's will be done, and you'll mean it, and you'll repent. You should do Bible study and have close contact with God. You can see this planet is truly on the brink of destruction, and that the only real hope is the return of Jesus Christ established in His kingdom. That's the way, and when His kingdom comes, people will live God's way 
And if you're called in this age and faithful to the end, you will help teach people how to do that. And you'll know better how to do this because of the fact you had to do this, live it in this age where you have given opportunity. I shouldn't say have to, but you choose to obey or you don't choose to obey. Um, it, some other things that uh, are going to happen is you would want to support the commission to preach the gospel. I read Matthew 24, 14 about the gospel kingdom being preached the world's a witness, but I'm going to go to verses uh, uh, 21 and 22 to tell you what Jesus says is going to happen to humanity. Matthew 24, 21. This is after the gospel has been preached as a witness. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 21, For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of this world until this time, no nor shall ever be, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, they will be shortened. There will be, uh, the elect will be alive during this time. So this will be saved for our, uh, humanity will not destroy the planet. Jesus will come and intervene. In Malachi 4, verse 6, the Bible prophesies about that Elijah had come. It says, He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children of the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. If you read what it says, it actually means total destruction. If God's calling you, you should wholeheartedly support His work. You've got, you'll have a tremendous knowledge and you should appreciate this and you want to Help fulfill Matthew 24, 14 and other scriptures. The Bible warns in Hosea 4, verse 6 about people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because they've rejected knowledge. You've got scientists who reject the truth. Interestingly, on the back of this booklet on this God's existence logical, there's a scientist, Nobel Prize winner, who rejected truth. He admits he re rejected truth, basically. It's also mentioned in this book. People have rejected the knowledge. Scientists do not always follow the science. There's ego, pride, politics, personal interest, whatever. You're unique. Your life's experiences make you one who can give love in a unique way. You don't have to go there, but Jesus said to let your light shine and so men may see your good works and glorify God your Father. That's in Matthew 5, 16. If God's calling you, you should, uh, amongst other things, do what it says in Ecclesiastes 9.10. You don't have to go there. Whatever your fine hand finds do, do it with all your might. And let me go to 1 Corinthians 10. I'd like you to go there. First Corinthians 10, starting verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, if you're being called, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or the, to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but for the profit of many that they may be saved. As a Philadelphian Christian, despite struggles, you'll have the desire to give and to share with this wretched world. You want to put your whole heart in God's work. You want to completely dedicate yourself to having a part in warning the world of the dramatic events to occur before the end of this age. And assist in us reaching people that God's going to call in this age. Remember, the fullness of the Gentiles has to come in. You know, you should realize this physical world cannot continue as it is. You're not going to put your trust in politicians or who gets in what election or whatever. And when you think about uh, Upside-down marriages can be put right side up and how you can have your part in turning the hearts of the fathers of children, etc. You should be able to rejoice. You can have a part in God's work. You take great satisfaction in the knowledge that you're helping reach the world. You will help teach them how to have happy homes, happy children, happy marriages, and everything by going God's way. God is calling some for a special purpose, and he reveals his truth to those he calls. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 2. Starting in verse 9, the Apostle Paul wrote, 
But as is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. So we see the Spirit of God reveals these things to us. When you answer God's call through repentance and baptism, God actually places the Spirit within your mind. It gives uh, your mind... Gives... Okay, I'm going to read something. I keep stumbling over my notes, so let me just read this. God's Spirit gives a human being the mind and will of God along with the power to obey God. Then, with that knowledge, that that you can get more knowledge. Those called who have God's Spirit are completely different from any person who doesn't have God's Spirit. And in Romans 8, 14, we see that those called baptized actually become begotten children of God. It says, Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, if you're in Romans 8, let's go back to verses 7 and 9. Romans 8, cutting in verse 7. The carnal mind, the mind without God's Spirit, is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So that is why this is a massive difference, if you have it or not. If you've got God's Holy Spirit, you are completely different from those who don't. True Christians are those who have God's Holy Spirit. It's that, you know, that, you know, that what separates us Christians from those who aren't Christians. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not His. And unless God personally, directly, miraculously intervenes and part of His life to open His mind to grant Him His Holy Spirit, uh, you won't be a true Christian. That's just the way it goes. Now, there is a, a, a thing I do want to talk about this. There is a special category that's a bit different. So, we can go to uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. And that is, these are the children of uh, those who have uh, of one or more converted parents. 1 Corinthians 7, 14, Paul wrote, for the unbelieving husband sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife by the, sanctified by the children. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they're holy. So your children do have an opportunity for salvation. Now I want to read something the old uh, Worldwide Church of God wrote. This is from Herbert Armstrong, uh, Good News Magazine, October, November 1980. You need to know whether your child has access to God. When Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father has sent me, draw him. And God draws only a very few. He's specifically calling to a commission preparing for the kingdom of God. But if you, a husband and wife, are in God's church, have you realized what places, that places your children in a different category with God? God has revealed exciting, important knowledge. Your children, if you're a truly converted member of God's church, can believe in Christ and are not cut off from God. And much of God's truth, even though as yet too young to be converted. They're a special treasure to God. So if you are a true Christian, consider that God is allowing your children to be called now. Teach them properly. Don't live as a hypocrite, but live as a type of example that God wants you to live. But maybe your parents weren't Christians. Uh, mine were not Church of God Christians. Uh, you know, it's not the time for everybody. Maybe it's not your time. Let's go to Romans 10. Not an, everyone will hear enough of the truth to respond to it in this age. And Romans 10, verse 14 and 15 helps uh, show that. How then shall they call upon him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? So those who don't hear or see the truth are not being called in this age. 
Of course, we also see from this that uh, there are preachers supposed to be sent. Or, and there are others hearing it and being called in this age. But people are in the process of being refined. Those called in this age are refined one way, according to Isaiah 48.10 and Jeremiah 9.7, whereas those called in this age are to be refined and purified more like silver and gold. You see that in uh, Zechariah 13.9, Psalm 66.10, Daniel 11.35, 12.10, and it's also mentioned in Revelation 13.8. Now, what could be some clues that God is not calling you in this age? Well, if you don't feel any reason to repent and change, you're probably not really hearing God's call. If you cannot accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're really not hearing God's calling. If you believe that humanity can solve its uh, problems apart from God, you aren't really hearing God's calling. If you believe that human traditions are more important to how you live your life than the Word of God, you're really not hearing God's calling. You know, we've got people who have different holidays, supposed to be biblical holy days, etc. Now, if you started to count the cost of being a true Christian, and you concluded it's too high, then you're not really hearing God's calling. Now, as it turns out, none of those prove God's not calling you. And remember, even Moses and Saul uh, uh, resisted. God might be calling you, but you might not have the, you might not be in the right mindset to respond. And perhaps your real calling will come later. But if it's now, realize that God holds us individually responsible for what uh, we do with what we know. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 30, read verses 19 through 20. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, and may, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. Yes, you're supposed to make a choice, a choice who you're going to obey. Now I'm going to read something from the book of Romans, New Testament, Romans 6, starting with, uh, read uh, verse 16, and this is from the New Living Translation, Romans 6, 16. Don't you realize that you become slaves of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. People say, oh, I didn't choose the way of sin. Well, if you don't choose the way of God, you've chosen to be a slave of sin. You know, so will you choose to obey God or life of sin? A life which will be vain rebellion against God because God is all-powerful and God is going to win. Now, it says in James 4, verse 17, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it's sin. So if you know what to do, you're supposed to do it. Now, in John 8, verses 31 through 32, I want to read something that Jesus taught. Jesus said, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If you know the truth, you should act on it. So if you think God is calling you, don't give up. Have faith in God, as it says in Mark 11, 22. Now, I want to go to Romans again. Romans 11, verse 28. Read, uh, read that. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Your calling is irrevocable. Okay? Paul's telling us this. God does not revoke your calling, so don't you do it. You need to choose whether or not you want to accept it. Now I want to go to Philippians 1. Sometimes people get concerned. But I want to go to Philippians 1, starting in verse 3. Apostle Paul wrote, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this very thing, 
being confident in this very thing. For he who has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if God's calling you and you'll accept the calling and you stick with it and obey, God will complete it. God's not going to give up on you. Verse 7. Just as right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both of my both in my chains and defense confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of, with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. As you're called, your love should abound more and more in knowledge and in all discernments, that you may approve the things which are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being fulfilled the fruits of righteousness that are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. It says in Romans 8, and I've read this before, but I wanted to read it again, read verses 30, but I'm going to add verse 31. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, those he called, he also justified, those he justified, also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yes, we have all kinds of problems we've got to deal with. But if you continue in love, uh, Hebrews 13, 1, God will continue with you. Now, of yourself, it's impossible to be saved, but God is certain if we yield to him and trust him, we shall be saved, not by our own power to overcome and develop character, but through faith in God's power. God won't let you fail if you endure the end in the conditions he set for salvation. You're to live the give way of life, not the get way that the world under Satan's sway has accepted. You support the end time work of God to reach people with the good news of the coming kingdom of God. And I've held up the gospel book a few times. You get to choose. Make the right choice. If God's calling you, accept it. For more information on whether or not God's calling you, again, we have this free booklet available at ccog.org as well as the other ones that I've mentioned. If God's calling you, don't turn your back on God. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.